is based on life around me. And if you call London a work of art, a piece of dog shit a work of art, then fine. After a year at drama school, I'd done some extra work at Pebble Mill, and a month later, a director turned up asking to see me. He, he wanted me for this part in a play, and it was part of a series called Second City First, and the play I was in was called Glitter. And it sort of launched me when that was shown on the network. Kate Nelligan and Maximilian Schell at the National Theatre were watching that play, and they wanted me for this small part in Tales from the Vienna Woods. So I got a phone call the following day, so they come down to London. I went down to London with a carrier bag and never went back. I had no money whatsoever. And I got this warehouse. And I just went out to all the rubbish dumps in the area and built the place. I want one double and six singles and six twins. Okay, right, okay, thanks very much. Um, you, you've got the double and four twins. So you, you, you don't have any singles. Mayhem started off as a sort of over-ambitious multimedia idea. And the whole idea was for anyone to go in there and try and create something. I love objects of mystique. I've got a head in my room, a head which tells you how to read bumps and things. I don't understand it, but I love to look at it. 
I like strange objects that mean things about religion, things that just conjure images up in my imagination. And what I do on a, an uninspired day, I just sit in that room and look around me, look at all the different things I've got, and just think about them. Why don't you keep up with the times, crabs? You're an antique like this place. What's the postcard, Mad? It's New York. And you can forget it. It just had the bread to con the rest of the world. America's dead. It's never been alive. I met Derek Jarman one day because while I was at the National, this actor arranged for me to have tea with Derek. So I went along and I sat on a settee and there was a script under there called Jubilee. And I just said, can I play the part of Mad in this, please? And Derek just said yes. All these ruins. All this concrete, brick and glass. And the people who made them are utterly forgotten. The prisons we live in today might have taken more than a day to build. But it doesn't take long to destroy them. <laughs> you can't! <laughs> Derek offered me Miranda, which is the first time I've really ever experienced Shakespeare, and I was very frightened of doing it. But I refused to give it up because I like a challenge, and that was the biggest challenge in my acting career yet. What is your name? Miranda. My father. I broke your head to say so. I'm in my condition of prince, Miranda. I do think a king. The very instant that I saw you, did my heart fly to your service? And for your sake, am I this patient logman? Do you love me? Beyond all limit. And what else of the world to love, prize, honor you? I am a fool to weep at what I am glad of. Why weep you? At mine unworthiness. But dares not offer what I desire to give, much less take what I shall die to want. I am your wife. If you will marry me. I don't believe people ever know themselves. And a lot of things with actors and actresses, they try so desperately to know themselves and think that they know themselves, but they never do. Uh, for me, when I act, uh, I'm escaping from my own problems. It's, it's kind of therapeutic for me, as well as, of course, being incredibly exciting. Uh, there's nothing better than being someone else. It's sort of deceiving. It's, it's uh, a childish instinct in me. To, to lie. I like acting because it's lying. He ain't coming, your friend Carol. He turned off with his mates across Albert Bridge. He's gone across the river to Wandsworth, where he belongs. But that allowed juvenile to meet Quince in Chelsea after nine o'clock at night. Oh, it's very pricey as Chelsea. Even council ain't cheap. He's outside. They're all outside. Well, well, well. He's looking up here. <laughs> the others ain't. Maybe he's got to declare himself. I mean, he cannot lie, can he? He's fallen in love with Derek. Good, good, good. Let's do that again. It is a bit strange, isn't it? Sugar and Spice is about four or five women who um, go back to a prostitute's flat. One of the girls out of the window sees a, a, a gang of boys and invites them up. So the tension up to that point in that little section has been to do with Carol and the window and you watching whether she's going to the window or not. Ever since she came into the room, she's had her eyes on the window and you've had her eyes on her. I'm the man-hater. I fancy one of the birds and I arrange for her to have an abortion and now I have her under my thumb. And it's about me manipulating her and another bloke to get all their clothes off and then I start a great big fight. Carol is why we're up Chelsea. Carol is why we were on the pavement. That and Derek wanted to see the grounds on account, but he is a football supporter, but Carol is why we were up Chelsea, ain't she, Carol? She does like a good life. She likes to have a bloke to look at, eh? 
Thought we wasn't going to discuss me, Sharon. Do you live here alone, Suze? Oh, I can't. Do you live here alone, Suze? What do you want to be? Receptionist or something? Oh, what do you want to be, Sharon? A security guard? I'm one of them girl muggers. I'm one of them girl muggers you read about in the Daily Mail. I hide behind bushes, split me trousers, jump out at old men, hit them round the head and say, take me home, please. <laughs> Shut your face. When the night does midnight, time to close into a broken street. A bowl of fruit painted by a man just gives you an image to look at, to think about, to stimulate your mind. I've put that down to music. You listen, you think, and you stimulate your mind without having it drummed into you that, oh, there's people out of work, there's people on the dole, there's people being murdered. So bloody what? There always has been, there always will be. I'm just trying to offer something different. I am not part of the old movement called punk. I am part of the future. Living, living once your life. Charlie! Did someone call Charlie? I don't care how the audience responds to me. I'm not there to tell them how to behave when I'm on stage. Uh, of course, because I'm a woman, they want to grab my body and do vulgar things. They want to fantasize about me, which is fine because that's what my music is. It's pure fantasy. Sex was inspired by when, whenever I walked near the audience, there'd just be hands clambering all over my body. And I, I just thought, oh, insects, insects. But on stage, I go into the audience and I just let them rip me to pieces. I've never gone hungry. I've never suffered through lack of money in any way. Not because of my parents, anyway. They wanted the best for me, like all parents do for their children. They wanted me to have a very good education, 
to become a polite child, to be taught good manners and have a future. The door is a when I was bullied at school, it was because of my character. I was a weak child, I was incredibly small. I had um, speech impediment. I was the perfect bait for bullying. My dad took me out the back and taught me how to punch hell out of someone. And from then on, I was never bullied again. The door is a hole, and it's open wide. Naked as a bee. I went out with guys first when I was about 13 till I was 15, and I just stopped. I never actually went out with a woman or anything. I genuinely thought I was a lesbian, purely because I wasn't interested in men, but at the same time, I wasn't really interested in women. And that's why I concentrated so hard on my career at such an early age. Tell me you love me, if not, then tell the truth. Smiles mean friendship, but silence won't. I actually have my clothes made, and I think I found a designer that works with my mind. To me, she's brilliant. And there's like that's Melissa. Mm, just plain clothes, like, that's just them. But they've just got a seam across yeah. there. So I don't think buy, like, like a woman in any way, really. I do put makeup on. I do care about my appearance, and that's the only female thing about me. I think like a man because I work with men, and I don't like being beaten by men. I am a female chauvinistic pig and I like to win. Music is an incredibly rough business. Uh, going on tour and things like that, that will kill me within a year, I think, being on tour. Uh, it's the most knackering thing you can do. So, so acting helps bring me back down to earth again after doing a tour.
Camera two next. I'll be mixing to it. Twenty seconds. Fifteen. Counting out to two K. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And cue him. Good evening. On straight camera to the one next. We're focusing our attention on a Birmingham girl whose career as a rock singer, film actress, and professional rebel is bringing her national publicity and with it a degree of influence over the minds of her young followers today. In fact, it seems the bizarre one. Toya Wilcox described camera the two next. as the punk princess is currently in vogue. Thank you, Keith. In the past few weeks, she's found a place in the columns of the best Sunday newspapers and the glossy magazines. 
and her individual style is in demand with cinema and TV um, directors. Two. And since 1977, her band, called simply Foyer, has followed her own music style. VT there next. Sci-fi rock, Run VT. new music, Nine, and intergalactic eight, cowboy music. Seven, Certainly, six, it's different. Five, and that's also cutting to it. Her style Three, and presenting the look two, here program. one, BBC on VT. It's us again. Good. We're back. Oi. 20 seconds. Cutting to caption on one at the end of this. It's a very quick one. Counting out of VT. Ten, nine, eight, Hi, seven, here we are, back in the six, five, four, three, two, one. In the next eight weeks, two, we'll be featuring some of the one, best bands in the middle. And one. Toya, however, is more than just an image. She has strong views about matters which affect young people and worry parents. And opposite her are three people who don't necessarily share all her views. Roger Perks, as a headmaster, Toya had some fairly sharp criticisms of the educational system that let a bright and articulate youngster like her mm. slip through the net. Yes. Are you disturbed by that? I'm disturbed as a professional, yes. So what I would like to ask Toya is, as a young girl from a wealthy family, you went into the risks business. Had you failed, you could have always fallen back into the bourne of your family. No, I couldn't. I was too proud. Were you? Uh, I was unhappy because I knew I wanted to, to act and sing. The school I was at didn't um, take that ambition seriously at all. and They wanted me to be like everyone else in that class. The only thing I was encouraged to do was to, want to, was to pick a rich man, do needlework and do cookery. I was chucked out of art lessons when I was about 14 and it really upset me because I loved art. And after that, I just said, well, good riddance to you, because I don't need this schooling to, to get me where I want to go. But when I, when I find out about your, you know, sort of in-store promotion in a certain chain store, for instance, yeah. uh, this coming week with the, with the album Blue Meaning, and I see you in a series such as Shoestring, I'm, I'm wondering whether you're not becoming the victim of the system which you're trying to criticise. <laughs> um... I am naive, but I'm naive in a way that I'm protecting myself from becoming too bitter. I understand how the business works. I know when I'm being exploited, I know when I'm about to be exploited, and that's when I become the biggest bitch on this planet. Let, let me ask uh, Anthea McIntyre at this point, where do the kids go when they leave school? What do they have to identify with? Yes, I, I tend to think that a lot of what Toya is offering is actually destructive, which is very much easier than, than offering something constructive. And I wonder, if, in fact, Toya yes. isn't exploiting this and offering them some sort of fantasy, ex exploiting their need for fantasy. No way. Well, it's actually living off it. about helping old people and doing community work. Well, That's that isn't exactly what one would identify with your image. Well, true, but uh, as everyone's been saying, not everyone can get up on the stage and, and, and be successful. It does take a, lo a lot of luck, which is what I've had. Do you, do you not think that perhaps you use punk as a little bit of a tag? You have been tagged as the professional punk yeah, to get uh, your own career I do not up. use punk whatsoever because uh, my philosoph philosophies are so um, different. My morals are, are so straight. It's unfortunate, as you say. I'm not punk, I'm a media. modern woman. I also think you're cleverer than some of the people you accused in the music business as well. Thank you. <laughs> what a nice man. Let me come back to Anthea, though, because you yes, said... I, I don't feel the need to sort of dye my hair. I don't feel the need to project an image. Because I was interested, Toya says that she wants to be herself. And yet, um, you're also talking all the time about cre creating an image and yeah. projecting an image, um, as if you have to impress people all the time. It's not... Is that really necessary? And is it, uh, being a modern woman, necessary to sort of uh, force it down everyone's throat? Oh, I'm not like. forcing it down anyone's throat. It, I just happen to be pretty loud in the way I look, and it gets jammed down people's throats. I thought the funniest thing was the headmaster afterwards, wanting your autograph for his kids. I thought that was great. I thought he was really sweet. He was. No, I thought it went very well. I was really pleased. I must pleased. admit, I was expecting about... I was expecting three great big thugs called National Front. Right. Uh, I was as well. You bloody punk rocker. <laughs> <laughs> Tacky. 
It's the bass I'm not sure about. I still think you're playing too much, Charles. Play more with the drum. Charlie, the bass needs to be a bit more sustained in the way it's played. Two years ago now, we did a gig at a theatre called the ICA Theatre and we got amazing reviews for it. The week the reviews came out, we had a phone call from Germany and at that time I was making Quadrophenia. I had to rush down to London, do a quick rehearsal for this record company called Safari. They asked us to sign there and then. It meant we could become professional. We'd have regular money coming in that we could do more concerts and things. I wasn't excited because I was worried about record companies and being ripped off and things like that. So now we've had two years experience. We know our capabilities. We know where we want to go. And it's all thanks to Safari allowing us to grow within our own time. Still too busy, if not punchy enough. The rhythm's being overshadowed by what you're doing. Leave out, the, leave out the third note. Du, du, da, da. Du, du, da, da. We'll leave the symbols out, Steve. The second album is the latest one with a new single on. Uh, it's called The Blue Meaning. And here she is, the lady herself. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Toya. <laughs> I can't help it if I have so much charisma, I wipe four blokes off the stage, and I don't believe that's true. If people prefer watching me, it isn't through my doing. I say this with all due respect to the band, I work harder than any of them, and it's up to them to keep up with me if they want as much publicity as I get. Hi, you. As per usual, I forgot your name. Sid! Why, of course, the immortal one. <laughs> the silly black Lulu. We've both done what I've done. I don't know if I'm multimedia or not. I am slightly jack of all trades, but I am most definitely an actress and a singer. And if that means multimedia, yes, then I am. You have to package yourself. It's a form of presentation. You have to present yourself in something acceptable. Past. Rob your distance. 
And lift your head up a little bit more. Okay. Right. Back to the same pose again. Turning your body towards my hand. Right, that's it. As far as being successful, the desperation comes from childhood ambition of stardom. Right. right. Yeah, that's it. Hold it there. Yeah. I would like to become a commercial cult figure. Because I believe if you are a cult performer, your following is so strong and so sort of religious right, yeah. that they're fans of yours, the whole of your working life. It's excellent. That's the sort of audience I'm looking for, an obsessed audience. Straighten your head again. Yeah. If I wasn't successful, it would be purely because people don't like what I am. So what I'd do, I'd create a character. I'd try and create the perfect person and become it. I'd be prepared to do that if I completely failed. Because I believe if you can't beat them, join them, then corrupt them. Acting and singing are equally important, that's why I do them. Acting doesn't take up 24 hours a day and music doesn't take up 24 hours a day and that's what I like. I like being busy the whole time. I like having to think the whole time. Uh, when I'm at my tiredest, I get my best ideas. So if I had to do one career, I'd find it incredibly frustrating because it wouldn't satisfy my imagination enough. <laughs> When I was young, I was petrified of the darkness. I used to go to bed, then the door would slam, and there'd be footsteps round and round and round my bed for hours. And then suddenly something would shake, push me down into the bed, then let go, so I bounced on the bed, and then whisper something in my ear, which I'm not going to tell you about. It's not very nice, quite obscene. I conjured up this image, and it became a repetitive nightmare after a while. Then a year ago, I was given a book called The Necronomicon by H.R. Geiger. It's the equivalent of the Bible, that's its importance, but it takes a much more naturalistic view on the creation of life. Anyway, I opened up this book, and the pictures were the exact copy of the nightmares I had when I was five years old, from what the voices told me what was said would happen to me. And I had this image of, like, babies being sucked into a machine and being turned into meat to be eaten, and just babies being fouled and debauched and sexual things that I didn't understand at the time. And it was the exact image I had when I used to go to sleep at night.
Yeah.